Mike DeVivo. Welcome to Diversity Conversations. We have today Nicholas Kristoff, who is the inaugural speaker in this year's Diversity Lecture Series. Mr. Kristoff has conducted substantial field work throughout much of Africa, as well as Southeast Asia, South Asia, East Asia, and elsewhere throughout the world. He has authored with his wife, Half the Sky, a landmark book that is used in the World Regional Geography course here at Grand Rapids Community College. And I'd like to first start off asking Nick about your, about your background. You were raised in Oregon and your father was a, a distinguished professor at Portland State University. Would you care to comment about your father's influence in your life? Sure. Um, um, you know, I had this sort of strange uh, childhood because we grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere, a sheep and cherry farm. On the other hand, this was a, a sheep and cherry farm that had a 30,000 volume library <laughs> with books from all over the world. My dad spoke, uh, you know, depending on how you counted, seven or eight languages. And uh, we always had visitors internationally. So, um, in some ways, it was an incredibly traditional kind of Norman Rockwell childhood, but it also did have this very strong international flavor. And um, my dad was also a refugee from Eastern Europe. Uh, he uh, had, his family had lost everything in World War II. Um, he swam the Danube River to escape from Romania, ended up uh, in a uh, concentration camp in what was then Yugoslavia, uh, had some very close calls, ended up in France, and then decided that, you know, a, a Slavic refugee in France was not going to have much of a future. And even though he did not speak English, thought that America would be more accepting of refugees, and made his way to the U.S., um, learned English, became a professor, and um, he, um, yeah, I mean, he, he accomplished a tremendous amount in his life, but it was also through the help of some others. I mean, he would not have been able to, to do that if other people hadn't helped him as well. And he was always certainly very aware of that. And I think, you know, his experience taught me um, the importance of resiliency, the importance of education as a way of, of overcoming problems, but also the importance of a helping hand periodically. Well, it was commented that he would frequently pick up hitchhikers, I guess, while he was driving. He would, yeah. I mean, he would always sort of show up uh, uh, some evening with some, you know, hitchhiker who'd be on the couch for the night. Um, <laughs> you know, especially if it was a, a a foreigner who he, you know, thought it was important to show hospitality to, and um, he would, um, you know, always break into conversation in, you know, a, a different language with somebody. Uh, sort of try them in French, try them in German, uh, uh, try them in Romanian and Polish and Russian and. Serbian. I mean, he could kind of go down a pretty long list of, of languages with people. That's amazing. It really is. And, and for him to have uh, spent so much time of his early years in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, during the Cold War, you're growing up in Oregon. Tell me, how did that affect you? Did, have you ever reflected upon that? Um. I mean, it's interesting because um, <coughs> I think that having spent time uh, in the communist world and um, and watching it closely made my father very, not just non-ideological, but almost anti-ideological. He was uh, very suspicious of any kind of overarching ideology or way of looking at the world and very much a believer in, well, you know, kick the tires, see what works. Um, and I, I certainly, uh, I think I inherited that view. And then living in China myself um, later made me likewise, uh, you know, very suspicious of people who have who try to sort of, who always kind of follow very very broad principles um, without it seems to me a you know thorough grounding and skepticism about every single step of the way. Well, he was certainly a brilliant intellectual and made significant contributions to political geography. 
and I suspect, though I don't know, I suspect that that broad smattering of, uh, of geography and political science and other areas in the social sciences influenced you as well. As, as you grew later, you um, took a Wunderjahr, I guess, in your young adulthood and traveled where? Um, I, well, between high school and college, I worked in France uh, for a uh, summer um, uh, picking fruit and trying to work on my French. And um, then uh, somewhat later, I spent a lot of time uh, backpacking around Africa and, and Asia, um, trying to pay my way by, by writing articles. And I thought, you know, wow, this is an incredible deal. You get to travel, and then you get paid for writing about it. Um, so then that made me think that, you know, wow, being a foreign correspondent would be a pretty ideal job. And that led me uh, to what I'm doing right now, to, to being a journalist. Is is that a strong possibility for young adults today to to become foreign correspondents in the same fashion you became one? Well, it's um, it's incredibly competitive. Uh, everybody, you know, wants to uh, an awful lot of people who want to be journalists because it is so appealing, it is so uh, attractive as a lifestyle, and uh, you know, in the sense that it's a way to help change the world a little bit in a positive way, you can make a difference. In one respect, it's probably harder in that a lot of the major news organizations have been cutting back on their uh, foreign correspondence, so there are fewer uh, positions in the traditional news organizations. On the other hand, there are um, more than ever who are out there, typically you know, young people who have a language, have some interest in an area, and uh, write for blogs, write for um, specialist magazines, and support themselves that way. And it's a very tenuous, difficult thing to sustain, but there are indeed a fair number of opportunities along those lines out there. Well, I'm sure that's welcome news for a number of students that are interested in journalism and, and wish to travel, though they might find themselves not necessarily traveling to resorts, but to uh, the far ends of the earth. I think some of your colleagues have commented that winning a trip with you isn't necessarily such a great prize after all, is it? Well, the, the joke at the New York Times about my, my win a trip contest is that um, uh, first prize is indeed a trip with me on a reporting trip to the developing world. A second prize is two trips with me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good one. That's a real good one. How important is it for uh, young adults who are interested in that to uh, have some foreign language aptitude or foreign language abilities? I think it's very important that uh, young people gain a foreign language and also gain some experience traveling. I don't really think that you can consider yourself educated in the world today if you haven't set foot out of our kind of lifestyle and that, um, you know, I mean, a lot that might mean traveling abroad, but there are also a lot of ways you can step outside of this kind of lifestyle within the U.S. Uh, it's an, essentially what I think young people should do more of is get out of their comfort zone. And that can mean um, working with disadvantaged kids in a um, troubled neighborhood. It can mean working with prison inmates, get some sort of insight into, into that background. It can mean um, uh, teaching English in or studying Spanish in Bolivia. Um, and Spanish in particular, I think, is going to be increasingly important for the America in which young Americans today will grow up. I think that, I mean, it's, I think it's already important and useful, but I think uh, 30 years from now it will be even more so. I think there are going to be more Americans who will be retiring in um, Latin America because it will be a cheaper place, a lower cost place to retire. I think there will be more, more Latin Americans in the U.S., more Anglos in Latin America. I think we're going to be more um, tied economically, culturally, uh, politically, and so I think that young Americans would be very, very well advised to work on their Spanish and to develop some kind of a broader understanding of Latin American culture and society. Well, you're, you're talking about two things. You're talking about the gap year, which you've endorsed, taking a year off between high school and college or shortly after receiving a bachelor's degree 
and then also Latin America. Uh, the gap year, again, something that you endorse. It's, it's interesting that Americans, by and large, don't go out and explore the world as compared with people from other developed countries. What, what do you suppose is the reason for that? You know, I think a lot of parents and students alike uh, think that if a graduating high school senior uh, goes off and takes a year that he'll be diverted and you know, may never go on to college. And I think they also um, are concerned about the expense uh, of travel. Um, uh, my eldest son took a uh, gap year, just finished a gap year, um, and so now he just began his freshman year. And I was sort of amused that very often my wife and I would be um, we'd be engaged in sort of competitive parenting as parents are wont to do. And so we would uh, uh, say to somebody, you know, very proudly that, oh, you know, our, our son is, yes, you know, he's off on a gap year. And they would look at me with great concern and say, I'm sure he'll be okay. He'll get over it. <laughs> Clearly thinking that he'd had some kind of a terrible crisis and uh, was in drug rehab or something. Um, so, I mean, I think that's kind of the psychology of it at the moment. Um, I think that, uh, though, that you know, it did him and just about every other kid who's had one. Uh, it was a terrific advantage. It gives them an extra year of maturity. It's, you know, kids need sabbaticals every bit as much as faculty do. Uh, I think it gets them ready to study. And sure, there is a cost, but it's much cheaper to learn uh, Spanish, for example, in Peru than to learn it in a college classroom. Uh, you can go, the cost of living in much of Latin America is very low, and you can earn money on the side teaching English uh, to subsidize the expense. And that tends to be true of a lot of, of uh, travel. I mean, you know, Europe is expensive. Uh, Latin America, by and large, is not. Speaking of Latin America, do you have much experience in Latin America? Um, no, I frankly don't. So I'm kind of talking out of my hat here. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I have traveled around Latin America, but, I'm, uh, but I haven't, uh, haven't lived there, haven't spent nearly as much time there as uh, I have in, um, in East Asia, for example. And so that makes it, a, you know, it's a little bit strange because I have so many friends now who are coaching their kids to, to learn Chinese, for example. And um, you know, I speak Chinese. I think Chinese is an incredibly important language. China is important. But by and large, I think that you know, a kid's, the first foreign language a kid should learn is, is Spanish, given our geography, given the integration between the U.S. and Latin America. And then, you know, Chinese is a great second language. Well, the Hispanic population of the United States is increasing, and it's projected to be a much larger proportion over the next several decades. Um, what you're saying makes perfect sense. And in many ways, if we wish to engage in communication, um, by the same token, I suppose, one could argue that one may not be successful in the United States unless he or she has a mastery of English. I think that is definitely true. And I think that it is unfortunate. I mean, maybe this is just a, you know, a writer <laughs> speaking with my own biases of writing. But I think that writing and the ability to communicate is hugely important. And I do worry a little bit that um, f among a lot of young people that both reading and writing have faltered and so that people maybe can do a Facebook post but they get a little stuck when they do a lot when they want to write something longer and I think that um, again one thing I would really counsel young people to do is develop to the extent they can a real mastery of of writing because that ability to persuade people to express your thoughts clearly and compellingly is a hugely important skill, whatever you end up doing. I'm uh, really glad to hear you say that because I think that's one thing that we tend to emphasize in, in our Department of Social Sciences here is not just the notion of, of writing cogently, but the idea that writing facilitates an analytical thinking, a process that one engages in that enables a student, as he or she grows, to solve all kinds of problems. And that doesn't come, I don't believe, without writing. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely with you there. I do, um, I do think that, um, frankly, the academia has been part of the problem, that uh, in some fields, political science among them, 
it became um, very kind of fashionable to write in an extremely sort of erudite, highbrow way. It, and the more unintelligible you were, the more prestigious it was. <laughs> and that the upshot was that anything perceived as too popular almost had a certain bias against it. And that one result is that academics have to some degree marginalized themselves from much of the American conversation, which I think is very unfortunate. Um, and that um, just you know, lucid, terse, popular writing um, hasn't been emphasized enough in academia. It's, it's interesting you should say that as well, because when, when you spoke about political science and writing, immediately what came to mind was, was your father's writing. And he credited your mother, actually, with much, with much of it, the editing as well. Were there any discussions around the house about that? Well, my, it was sort of funny because, I mean, my dad, um, you know, even though English was his seventh language or something, he, has a, he had a bigger vocabulary than, than I did in English. Uh, I mean, he had a wonderful vocab vocabulary. But he had kind of a Germanic way of writing, so his sentences would go on for forever. <laughs> and... Um, uh, with the just enormous complexity. And my mother is a is a, a very, very, very beautiful writer. And so, um, yeah, she would go in and, you know, <laughs> divide every sentence into three or four and, <laughs> and um, you know, work on the, um, she, she certainly would edit him. And I mean, in fact, uh, my mom is still one of my editors. I send column drafts to her uh, by email and then she, she edits my, my columns today. That's great, she must be a remarkable woman. She truly is. Uh. Well, we, we've, we've talked about Latin America a bit, yet you seem to have had this affinity for, at least in recent years, Sub-Saharan Africa um, and North Africa to some degree, as well as Southeast Asia and South Asia. Um, would you care to talk about what draws you to those areas? Sure. Um, you know, I think a, a lot of us went into journalism sort of in the hope to some degree of making a difference. and. If you think about hugely compelling moral issues, a number of them um, do inhabit um, Africa or South Asia, for example. Um, one of the issues that got me very focused on, uh, on Africa was Darfur, and I spent, I made a dozen odd trips uh, to Darfur or, or the, the, the area around it, uh, reporting on that, and it go out there and you talk to people uh, whose children were killed because of the tribe they belonged to and the color of their skin. And it, uh, it just struck me that this is a genocide that is going on and that one can fight machine guns and bombers to some degree with a laptop and with a camera. And that, so, you know, that became my, my mission to try to bear witness to what was happening. Um, and it's not terribly effective, but at the margins, one can make a difference. And then that, uh, likewise, if you think about global poverty, about malaria, about tuberculosis, about AIDS, about so many of the, uh, the large challenges that do confront us, then um, many of them are particularly focused on, on Sub-Saharan Africa um, uh, and on South Asia, um, India, Pakistan, um, I become very interested in, in, in gender and in a lot of the very unpleasant things that happen to women uh, around the world because they are women, sex trafficking, for example, and things like that. Um, I mean, India and Pakistan are two of the worst countries for human trafficking in the world, and so that got me uh, very much focused on, on places like that. This, this matter of, of sex trafficking is... is is, is certainly a travesty. It's 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 horrific, and and you've you and and your wife have commented so well about it in half the sky. Um, all of my students have have commented that they are glad they have read the book after they've read it, uh, though they're deeply disturbed. And I guess that's part of the of the plan, in some ways. Yeah, I mean, you know, we really did uh, uh, want to kind of shake people up, and it. There are a lot of grim things happening out there, and uh, we um, we take them through some pretty rough territory in half the sky. 
we also, though, we don't just want to leave people sad and demoralized. We also want to remind them that change is possible. And so in so many of the stories we tell in A Half the Sky, they're, they're, the, the arc is a person going through some terrible experience. They've been, whatever, kidnapped by a human trafficker or sold to a brothel. But it's not hopeless. There is indeed something that somebody does that gets them out, and then they, they triumph. And what we really wanted to send a message was that change is possible, and it, it may not solve every problem, but, but one can make a difference and uh, to create something of a, of a toolkit about how one goes about that. You comment in, in, in your book how you've purchased girls out of slavery and yet have seen, seen a return to, to the bondage associated with the sex work. That must have been heartbreaking in many ways. Yet you continue to, to work toward addressing this issue and ameliorating these, these injustices, I guess, through your, through your writing. It's, it's certainly, certainly admirable. And I guess my question for you now is this. The, the human trafficking that takes place, particularly with regard to the sex work, how is it best addressed behind the scenes or rather harshly, with a big stick, I guess. Um, there is no, you know, th there is no simple solution. No policy works uh, works perfectly on trafficking or on these other issues. I mean, the truth is that helping people is hard. And I think that one of the problems that the humanitarian community has had is that it is sometimes oversold how easy it is to make a difference. It, it's hard. Not everything works. Um, and indeed, that instance where I bought a uh, young woman in Cambodia, um, you know, set her free, took her back to her family, uh, was a reminder of that. She turned out to be addicted to methamphetamine, and she, uh, she was so happy to be free, but she, after a few days, she began craving the meth, which she got from the brothel, and she ended up fleeing back to the brothel. Um, but the, I think that the, I mean, that I suppose is a reminder that, um, you know, rescues are, I, are hard uh, as a, you know, as a, as a would-be solution to trafficking. I think that what tends to work best is embarrassing countries and sort of naming and shaming them, and as a result, putting pressure through the police in those countries and, you know, helping those police so that they, uh, begin to crack down a little bit more on traffickers. And there is still going to be a certain amount of trafficking, but if the result is that the police then, you know, are, um, uh, you know, arrest enough traffickers that there is some risk and that the traffickers then want to um, steal motorcycles instead, then that's a net gain for humanity. And indeed, I saw that in Cambodia, that um, partly because of my work and because of the work of other journalists and aid groups, there was more pressure on Cambodia, and they sent the message down through the police, and the police never actually closed down the brothel where this girl was who I'd bought. They never closed it down, they never arrested the trafficker uh, who was kidnapping girls in rural areas, but what they did was they demanded more in bribes from that trafficker. And she was just a businesswoman. She was just trying to make money. And the upshot was that as they began demanding more and more in bribes, and for the first time there became a risk that she might actually go to prison, she ended up closing the brothel and turning it into a grocery store. And for me, that was a reminder that, you know, I, I'm probably 500 years from now there is still going to be there's still going to be prostitution, but we don't necessarily have to have a world in which 13-year-old girls are kidnapped in villages and locked up in cages inside brothels. Well, that's certainly a crime against human dignity. It's one last, one last um, element of this discussion also relates to your work in Africa, and that has to do with the uh, female genital mutilation that uh, takes place throughout much of Africa. Here, <coughs> there are a number of ways that institutions, organizations are trying to address it. Um, would you care to comment on that? Yeah, I think it's an interesting case because I think often uh, our efforts have been quite ineffective. 
Uh, since the 1970s, there's been really an international campaign to try to end uh, female genital mutilation. Um, you had laws passed in country after country. You had conferences and people flying in uh, to, to, try to, to try to make progress. And at the grassroots, really nothing happened. There was no difference. But meanwhile, there have been some efforts by people within each culture, within each community, to try to end the practice. And those actually have enjoyed considerable progress in, uh, in Ghana, in Senegal, in a number of countries, uh, in Egypt, for that matter. And I think that you know, it's maybe a reminder that often our best efforts as outsiders uh, to bring about change aren't just to go in and tell everybody, OK, here's what you got to do, you know, but rather to support local social entrepreneurs who are bringing about change from within and empowering them, giving them the, the resources, the tools to, to bring about that change. And I think often they are much better catalysts than we are. Certainly, that requires education. Absolutely. And girls, I mean, education and girls' education in particular is such a powerful way to bring about change. Uh, I, one of my frustrations has been that we, we encounter frustrating conditions in places like Yemen, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and instinctively we reach for the military toolbox. And there is no, there's no toolbox that is the quick fix. Nothing works perfectly, and we do need a military toolbox. But I think that education as a toolbox for change is not only much, much, much cheaper, but frankly, over about a 10-year period, has a much better record than the military toolbox. And I wish we were investing more in education in those kinds of places. It's an imperative. Mr. Christoph, thank you so very much for joining us. My pleasure. I'm delighted to be here.